So hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, what's new in photobiomodulation uh, with our esteemed guest, Penny Jean Gracefire. The video presentation will be uploaded to Successful Practitioner website once it's been processed. A little bit about our presenter today, Penny Jean Gracefire is a neural frequency analyst and published author who writes motorcycles, drinks tea, and designs therapeutic applications for emerging neurotechnology. She's a licensed mental health clinician. She constructs closed loop EEG based feedback paradigms, which alter neural dynamics in real time, helping people to recover from injury and trauma by improving cortical network flexibility and adaptive cascades. Penny Jean's groundbreaking work has led to industry wide changes in neuromodulation and is the basis for current standards and international certification. Her passions include spectral analysis, creative delivery mechanisms for caffeine, and taking things apart to see how they work. <laughs> so, thank you, and go ahead, Penny Jean. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. So, um, probably the number one thing that you guys need to know about me before we go on this fun little ride together is that I joke sometimes that my real job is being a frequency barista because what I'm terribly interested in at the core of everything is how do all of the different informational delivery mechanisms that we experience when interacting with our environment, how do those actually work together to help us track what's happening learn from what's happening and develop better strategies for just interacting with or engaging with the world. So I think for anyone who has some experience in any type of therapy, rehabilitation, neurofeedback, neuromodulation, these are the, often the core questions we're all asking is, how do people get information? How do we process it? How do we respond? And how can we make that easier or better for people who are struggling at any point of that process? So that's going to be the overall framework I'm going to talk from. And another thing that I will tell you is um, I probably started doing neuromodulation maybe like in 2004. I guess this is, this is going to be 20 years for me. <laughs> um, and from the beginning, I did have the benefit of being able to access quantitative EEG mapping options. So that allowed for me to do interventions and to put them together into sequences and to try different things in sessions and across sessions and see what the effects were. So my early work in pulsed electromagnetic frequency stimulation is really, I think, what led to my particular interest in photobiomodulation in general. So integrating in types of what we might call neurostimulation into neural feedback has been a, a really specific interest for me for a while because what I'm most dedicated to is just creating these conversations, creating these conversations with the brain where we are just being more clever and more effective at delivering slightly more sophisticated or complex information because brains are people. And you know what people don't love? Being bored. So our main job as, you know, providers of therapeutic intervention is to recruit attention from the brain, recruit attention from the person, engage them in the process. So a lot of the design principles I'll be showing you will be really rooted in that. Okay. So almost, I, I yeah, I think all the photobiomodulation options I'll be talking about today will be from the, the V-Light technology company for two reasons. One is that uh, I've worked with a handful of different photobiomodulation options, and honestly, I'm a fan of pretty much anything, <laughs> anything that delivers information, right? Um, part of the reason that I'm selected out VLA to talk about is because I've got the most familiarity with their different hardware and software options, and also because I've been working with them for the last few years to help develop more advanced capabilities in that photobiomodulation software and hardware set. So when I titled this, What's New in Photobiomodulation, my intent was to literally bring you up to speed on the current state of what's possible in photobiomodulation. Like, what is the tech we have now? What is it capable of doing? 
what does that mean for just using it maybe standalone as an intervention? And then how how could you consider maybe integrating it into a neurofeedback practice? Okay, so in light of that, uh, I feel like we all already have our conceptual framework about what we think neurofeedback is. So this will be a super brief orientation, just in case you are new, new, which in case you are welcome, because what I want to do is establish a couple principles that we're going to use going forward for thinking about photobiomodulation design, neurofeedback design, and integrating them together. Okay, basics of the concept of neurofeedback is popping those little electrodes on, being able to record them and then amplify them using some type of amplifier, and then um, I love I love how cute and old this picture is, where it's got the actual paper squiggles. And then we display those signals that we're recording in some way, usually on a laptop or some type of digital device, right? Now, when we're looking at the squiggles, remember, we're using amplifier because the electrical activity from the brain is so small. When we're looking at those little squiggles, there's usually two primary informational parameters that we're using to extract meaning out of the out of the squiggles, right? So amplitude and frequency are the two things we tend to zone in on, especially as neurofeedback people, we tend to zone in on those characteristics of the EEG to extract meaning. Now, if you've ever at any point used a radio, you probably remember the AM FM channel options. Do you know what AM and FM stand for? Amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. Because remember the whole concept of informational delivery? So when we think about like information, it, how do you how do you have all these channels on a radio where you actually change between frequencies and between amplitudes? And each frequency and amplitude differential has different information, literally different channels that can contain different inputs, right? So this is the one of the primary principles of how we even think about oh, delta, theta, alpha, beta, all of that. You know, we we arbitrarily sort of sort out into bins faster and slower moving frequencies. So we say, how fast or slow is the frequency? Like literally, how how is the frequency modulating? And then we say, how big or how small is the signal, the amplitude? So this is why we use phrases like big slow waves and little fast waves, because those organic elements um, mean that the, the actual available resources are power that our brain is, is generating um, an organic EEG signal, most of the resourcing is going to either go into the size or the speed. So you get big, slow waves or little fast waves. And they have clear visual patterns, like clear visual morphology or shape of the wave, right? This allows for us to like look at EEG and pull meaning out of it. So the concept of how do we how do we think about well, now we're looking at EEG, we can track what it's doing. How are we supposed to give the brain back information about its EEG behavior? We're usually using one or both sensory inputs, auditory or visual. So why is it that we are actually choosing sensory inputs to deliver that information? Remember I said at the beginning, if if you bore the brain, you're going to lose its attention. <laughs> so our job is to recruit its attention. And one of the ways that we do that, you know, why auditory or visual can be so impactful is because at the bottom of your brain, there are two colliculi, the superior and inferior colliculi, and the superior colliculus is recruited by inputs from the visual cortex, and the inferior colliculus is recruited by inputs from the auditory cortex. And those two colliculi orient your attention in space. They prioritize how you pay attention to things in your environment. So if we can recruit the superior and the inferior with both vi visual and auditory information, the brain will actually prioritize those incoming inputs. We can capture the brain's attention. So the reason I am explaining this, something that might seem a little bit obvious, is because how we give the brain inputs, what we choose, the sounds that we choose and the visuals that we choose are going to make pattern recognition uh Essentially, we're going to prioritize ways in which the brain is recognizing patterns. So the auditory visual patterns, how we deliver those will either recruit or bore the brain. So it's our job to recruit the brain's attention so that our neurofeedback is effective.
part of why we use the auditory and visual inputs is because we know they recruit attention. So in that case, we are recruiting attention. What are we actually asking the brain to pay attention to? In the context of neurofeedback, because we're measuring different brain activity, we are literally tracking frequency modulation in delivering information based on changes in frequency modulation. Now, here's what we know about light. The brain also very much prioritizes light inputs. Now, a lot of what we think about is sort of that audio visual entrainment, like light through the eyes. And as I don't have to tell you, like visual information is not the same thing as the near infrared light that we're going to talk about in just two minutes with the photobiomodulation. But there are correlates in all spectral frequency distributions. So when we think about faster and slower moving EEG waves, we can also think about longer and shorter wavelengths of light. So there is faster and slower moving light, faster and slower moving brain waves, and we start putting together the correlates, there's higher and lower pitches of auditory frequency. When we start correlating out those spectrums, we can actually design things that sync up together to deliver more immersive and impactful types of feedback. So when we're thinking about designing feedback, a lot of what we pull from is the idea of uh, power, like local behavior and connectivity metrics more than network behavior. So if you're looking at EEG or quantitative EEG brain maps, um, a lot of what we end up considering when we're selecting neurofeedback protocols is what is the what are the local behaviors of the brain and then what are the more global network behaviors? Because it is relevant for us to think about how we regulate at a, at a local regional brain level, but then also those local regional behaviors impact how easy the local areas are to recruit into wider networks that then do more complex tasking and processing. So both of these are pretty critical when we're thinking about how we do neural feedback. And so these principles, these principles are pretty similar in some ways. So when we're thinking like, how do we choose neurofeedback options? We're thinking like, how many electrodes are we going to use? Where are we going to put them? What are we going to measure? The amplitude, the size of the signal, the frequency, the speed, the connectivity behaviors between the electrodes we've chosen, right? And so, you know, we can use as few as one or two electrodes and place them with intent and get some results. And then we can also uh, put more dense arrays and use all those electrodes to do some source localization and provide feedback on local activity or network behavior deeper in the cortex. So when we're thinking about giving that brain information, as discussed, auditory, visual are pretty common, but also we potentially can give input, feedback, haptic, vibration, right? But also, as of a few years ago, probably one of the more useful contributions that I've been making to the field of neuromodulation has been driving pulsed electromagnetic frequency or pulsed near infrared, driving it with changes in EEG. So now instead of just being a standalone STEM option where we pick out some parameters and we just run it, now the actual pulse EMF or the pulsed you know, near infrared is being modulated in real time by the changes in the EEG. So now it becomes a closed loop enhanced procedure. Now, over on the left side, the, the neurofeedback options, probably pretty familiar. Let's talk just a little bit about photobiomodulation. Now, what I am going to do is not spend a lot of time explaining how photobiomodulation works or what the benefits are because there is a fantastic little website with my collaborator, um, VLight's put together, vlight.com. They put together a lovely website where they've got just a wonderful amount of visual and uh, visual information explanation, as well as you know research. If you guys go and poke around there, they're going to, um, there, there's a lot to find. There's a lot to look through. Here's what I would like for us to take away we're talking about like what's new and what's happening with photobiomodulation capabilities. The biggest thing I think that is of use to us right now, thinking about why would we want to use photobiomodulation, is actually the the energetic impact of using a near infrared light stimulation. We know that there is actually a cellular level mitochondrial 
energetic impact with the penetration of near infrared from good quality tech. So when you're thinking about, I'm trying to do rehabilitation or even habilitation, I'm trying to do therapy with people. And a lot of what we're seeing come in our door, especially in the last five years, has been people who have trouble with energy, trouble with availability of resources, right? They've got difficulty with actually pulling the resources to make them available to then do the learning or the repair or the infrastructure building that then supports faster processing speed, better local regulation, and better network capability. So it is true that if you are pretty good, if you are pretty good with your neurofeedback and being able to kind of pace and, and choose things with some some skill, um, you can really pace somebody in a neurofeedback treatment arc where they can have good outcomes. But if you've got someone who's really struggling in general with just having the physical resources available to engage with the neurofeedback process, what is a way we could potentially support that? So standalone photobiomodulation in and of itself is honestly, uh, it, it's the the literature for photobiomodulation near infrared or red light therapy is really quite robust for the last you know, 20, 30 years. But sort of the new emerging transcranial photobiomodulation, specifically trying to impact, you know, neural mitochondria, well, to say neural energy, uh, central nervous system energy, even more so than peripheral, right? Um, I would also say that the emerging research in that is is extremely promising. So this is why I was saying, go here, poke around. All the background that supports some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about is here and available. Okay, so with neurofeedback, how we modulate or deliver the information, I think, is really a function of picking out the parameters and assembling them. In a way, photobiomodulation is built out not dissimilarly. So when I was saying, oh, we're going to give you some light, there are a couple of ways to think about delivering that light. One is the actual nanometer or their wavelength. So there's different there's different impacts that come from faster and slower wavelengths of light. So you'll see like 1070 or 810 nanometers or 633 or 655. So longer and slower wavelengths of light give different impacts, right? So just pulsing, say, 810 nanometers, that's a common one, but maybe thinking about neural impact. If, you're, if we're pulsing 810 nanometers, that wavelength in itself has its, has its own utility. But then if you take 810, which is, you know, just you're just steady, giving, you know, delivering that, there's no change. You're just getting 810 straight up. If you pulse it, now the 810 wavelength is turning off and on at a speed. Let's say we pulse it at 10 hertz or we pulse it at 40 hertz. Now you've got the benefit of the 810 nanometer wavelength that whatever the you know possible therapeutic benefits that come just from the light alone. And then you've got the extra additional information of, you know, essentially pulsing it at an alpha frequency or pulsing it at a gamma frequency. So that's more layers. And so then it becomes, all right, where am I going to place my little LEDs? What frequency am I going to pulse them at? What wavelength, right? So so the capabilities, right, you know, of, of how we maybe can select out or make decisions about delivering photobiomodulation, this is the core of what we're going to talk about today because historically a lot of a lot of LED or light therapy delivery has been steady state. Steady state meaning you pick a wavelength and maybe you make a whole light panel with a bunch of LEDs and they're all essentially stimming. They're all uh, on at that steady state wavelength, right? Or Maybe you've got a couple LEDs that you've placed across the head and they're all delivering 810 nanometers as an example, or 1070, 1070. So historically, a lot of what we've thought about um, has been how do we select out the right wavelength? This is similar to how we, we say, how do we select out the right frequency range or frequency band and nerve feedback? Do I want to train alpha? Do I want to train gamma? This is somewhat equivalent to how we've, you know, historically thought about near infrared therapy or light therapy is how do we pick the right wavelength that creates an effect? So part of 
what has been new and developing, I would say both in neurofeedback and in photobiomodulation, is this concept of not so much doing a lot of, of complex evaluation to pick sort of a w- one simple intervention, pick the right simple intervention, but maybe slightly less burdensome evaluation or assessment to then select out a more complex potential intervention. So as you guys probably know, neurofeedback software and hardware has become more high resolution, more complex, more sophisticated over the last decade. So now we've got the ability to create neurofeedback protocols that are really quite sophisticated. And we're seeing that happening as well now with photobiomodulation. We're not just stuck with one steady state, you know, uh, wavelength. We can now pick and choose uh, different wavelengths, different pulsing, different locations. So in the last couple of years, one of the pieces of tech that V-Lite dropped into the, into the zeitgeist was the NeuroPro. And part of what is really kind of interesting about the NeuroPro as a device is at the time that they dropped it, it really was the most advanced photobiomodulation option we had on the market. So it had six little transcranial LEDs. This little guy that went across the head, you can see the little LEDs here. Like I said, it has six little LEDs across the uh, head. And then it also had an uh, intranasal light and a little light that you can pop at the base of the head, sort of targeting for that kind of brainstem cerebellum, sort of a lower occipital region. So that essentially gave us uh, eight total LEDs. And what was new and interesting was that um, it the, the little software interface now allowed for us to independently select out any of those LEDs, right? And independently, independently program them. So that meant that we could uh, essentially take the whole setup, right? We got one in the nose, six across the head, one in the back, and I could pick any of these and I could pick what frequency I wanted to stem at. I could actually choose to uh, do some uh, phase synchrony or asynchrony. I would watch some of them to stem, you know, uh, together and some of them to stem out of phase. So I, would get, I could get some some either synchronous phase, everybody do, working together, or some asynchronous phase behavior, which would introduce more variability. So obviously, synchronizing LEDs together would encourage more network uh, and more similar behavior. So if you've got a brain that's got too much independent activity, maybe because of injury or illness, you could help it to better synchronize at the network level by syncing all of your information. Or if you've got a brain that's got some state persistence, a little too much state persistence, maybe some diffuse global beta or something where you're wanting more in maybe too much slow wave. That's a pretty common one we see with, you know, brain injury and, you know, maybe even post viral syndrome. There's a lot of cognitive decline aging. There's a lot of slowing. We see diffuse slowing across the brain. How are you supposed to speed up and essentially differentiate out those ind- independent or individual local areas? So asynchrony, having areas, uh, having LEDs, uh, pulse out of phase can introduce variability. So these ideas of how do we introduce synchrony or asynchrony as well to create more similar or more independent behavior, these were capabilities that debuted with the NeuroPro. And what that then allowed us to do was design different, slightly more complex protocols that we didn't have the ability to do before. So for example, this little 10 minute protocol that I made, um, this one started, so it over 10 minutes, it started off just pulsing 10 hertz at the nasal and the little sort of cerebellum area. And then over the course of the 10 minutes, it actually increased how many LEDs were pulsing at 10 hertz till we had a full head of alpha pulsing synchronously, right? So this is following what we would think about as like sort of those subthalamic alpha generators, the thalamic cortical alpha generators where where do we actually see alpha happening at the bottom of the brain potentially? So we've got some cortical and some subcortical alpha generators. So how do we mimic the behavior to encourage that better alpha synchrony, right? Another one is potentially doing like, how do we take a brain that maybe has a little bit too much slow alpha, or maybe 
we would like for them, we would like to reverse that process. We could do like a wind down protocol where we start off with more sites, more LEDs with an alpha sync, and then we essentially uh, mediate down over a bit of time. So what this is doing is it's actually sequencing out. Just think about how, like, how the brain changes or shifts. How does it network areas together or uncouple those areas? Like what is it actually physically doing? Part of the design principles allow for us to mimic behavioral shifts across the brain, right? And so um, this, for example, is a, a little four LED protocol where the, the this is almost P4 and then a F4 to P3. The blue ones are in phase and the red ones are in phase. So that means when the blue ones are on, the red ones are off. And when the red ones are on, the blue ones are off. So the way that this works is we're essentially pulsing. We started off in 12 hertz and over about 13 minutes, a couple minutes at each frequency, 12 hertz, 13 hertz, 14 hertz, 15 hertz. We're literally pulsing across that sort of frontal to parietal sensory motor strip, right that area across the middle of the head. We're pulsing 12 to 18 hertz, creating kind of almost like a sort of like a, a low, an SMR-ish to low beta you know, I'm, I'm taking what we know about like old school, original SMR protocol training and neurofeedback. Uh, and I am essentially uh, elaborating and building on that to say, okay, how do we actually create some better connectivity between frontal and parietal, keeping in mind that um, there are specific behaviors we expect to see across that sensory motor cortex. So this one actually does like a little low beta sweep but what it's doing is it's really encouraging that cross connectivity behavior. So then what I can do is I can sequence out, let me start off in alpha, prime the brain a little bit, right? For state flexibility. Let me then do like some, some sort of strong sensory motor protocol sweep, right? And some frequencies I know really impact how we modulate out motor activity. And then at the end, let me do like a little alpha wind down so they've got better integration capabilities. And so, um, you know, this idea of doing like a gamma sweep, this one is they're all synchronized. Instead of having some independence, now I'm looking for just synchro synchrony. So they're all pulsing 37 hertz for a minute or two, then 38, then 39, then 40, but they're all pulsing at the same time. There's no, you know, fate, there's no asynchrony, they're all synchronous. So, um, and then I can tuck that into, <laughs> I can tuck that into, mil, into the middle of the alpha, the alpha bookends, right? Because what we're doing is we're starting to think like, how does, how can we tell the brain, give it to almost like a, like a, a model for how it can state shift back and forth between faster and slower frequencies? Because state persistence, the inability to adapt in real time to changes in environmental demand, People who hang out too frequently in the slow ranges or are too frequently in the fast ranges and they cannot shift between relaxed and engaged appropriately, they, these are often how we identify, you know, the state flexibility issues, right, or adaptability issues. This often shows up in slow processing speed, slow cognitive capabilities, um, irritability, stress, agitation, yeah. Uh, insomnia, like just almost everything that we would describe about people coming in and saying, I've got th this series of problems, almost all of it can be somewhat simplified down into this idea of engaging or relaxing, being able to having that state flexibility, being able to then, st you know, uh, speed up so that you can do some engaged or focused tasks, but then slow down and relax when it's appropriate to do that. So that state adaptability is really what drives a lot of function, you know, using something like a brain map, then lets us figure out <laughs> where are the sort of the vocal persistent behaviors that we want to maybe give the brain some more education or learning on how it can be more flexible in, in those areas. Now, um, this last one, this little, uh, let's do a little alpha and then let's do some gamma and then let's do a little alpha. Part of the reason this is one of those maybe what I would consider almost like a starter protocol for more sort of sophisticated intervention sequencing is because people who um, 
potentially start off with some of the tech offerings that say, here's here's a device that will pulse 800 to nanometers at 10 hertz. So you've got basically a little alpha pulsing. Or he- here's an option where you can pulse at 40 hertz. 10 and 40 hertz both have a significant amount of, I would say, research behind them, right? It makes sense to uh, support and draw the brain's attention to what it's doing in the alpha range. And it makes sense to draw its attention to what we're doing in the gamma range, right? Because if alpha is a barometer for state flexibility in a way, then gamma is a barometer for state capability. Essentially, your ability to to network together and do more complex, attentive processing. Yeah. So either one of these, if you've got poorly regulated synchronous or asynchronous galpha, uh, galpha, <laughs> gamma or alpha. I'm now mar- I'm already jumping to cross frequency coupling. That's in a couple bit of. So if you're if you're thinking about okay, why would I want to draw the brain's attention to its behaviors in alpha, or why would I want to draw its attention to its behaviors in gamma? These are tasking states that represent specific things that really impact our ability to function. Yeah. However, when you're working with what we might call, um, like I'm using the term neuromodulation very much as an umbrella for any type of informational delivery, auditory, visual, haptic, pulse CMF near-infrared, whatever, it's all just informational delivery. But what we deliver, whether it's auditory stimulation, visual stimulation, near-infrared stimulation, um, what we deliver is is a bid for attention, is an ask for attention, right? So when we pulse something at 10 hertz, right, if we pulse like the photobiomodulation 10 hertz, we're asking for the brain to pay attention to what it's doing in 10 hertz. And um, if we ask it for gamma, so there's a, a bit of what we might call a frequency following effect. And frequency following means it's the easiest, the easiest way for the brain to kind of process incoming information is to kind of get into that resonant frequency. Oh, you're, I, there's pulses happening at 40 hertz. And so your brain kind of resonates a bit and either, you know, maybe makes a little bit more 40 hertz activity and might make a little bit less 40 hertz activity, depending on how it's processing what's happening, right? But the core of what is interesting is there's going to be some there's going to be some type of temporary similarity cohesion so that it can process whatever that information is happening at 40 hertz. So there's a bit of a frequency following effect, but that is not the same thing as in the reorganization that happens afterwards. And so with a healthy functional brain, you stim it with anything you know, any type of neuromodulatory toy or tool or technique, you stim it with anything and a healthy functional brain will kind of have these little sort of uh, transient processing activation uh, behaviors it does, right? Maybe a little frequency resonance, a little frequency following, you know, more more activation in specific local regions, a little bit more networking. It's going to have these transient processing effects and it's going to take in the information you gave it and it's going to use it in some sort of kind of applied integrated way especially if you repeat the same information delivery pattern over time, it's going to learn and adapt how it prioritizes resource allocation and attention based on learning from repetitive exposure. This is why neurofeedback works. This is why any type of stimulation works, right? Learning. However, if you have a brain that's been injured, ill, that's got a certain amount of compromise to the, to the processing infrastructure, if your brain is too compromised, if your central nervous system is too compromised, then you can introduce information, visual, auditory, near infrared, whatever. You can introduce information and the brain may or may not really be able to integrate it in and do something useful with it, right? Because it's struggling to resource cortical activity in the first place. And also maybe there's been damage to some of the network or... or um just just the, the networking behaviors or the infrastructure behaviors cortically in general. So you've got a brain injury or like, you know, post pretty severe viral or infection, you know, brain, there's not going to be the same adaptability and retention that you usually see in a healthy brain. So that means you might stim somebody like with a little bit of gamma and there's a bit of that frequency following, some kind of some activation. And then when you stop, that brain does not always automatically then just sort of integrate it back in and kind of like, you know, re, re, 
recalibrate to sort of like a, a roughly steady state for itself, it might stay, it might hang out a little bit in that faster activated gamma. Now the person could feel like a little bit overstimulated, a little bit stressed, having, you know, you know, it could affect maybe just generally how they're experiencing the world. So, you know, there's impacts. And we even know from neurofeedback, if you overdo it a little bit, people might be wired and tired. We know that's a thing. So these are similar principles to how we might think about photobiomodulation. So part of the reason that I put together, let's do a little alpha on the front to prime. You guys will notice this, it's a little sequence here. Let's do a little alpha protocol at the front to prime. Let's do the, the gamma in the middle, and then let's put the little alpha wind down on the end so that we're not concerned at the same level. The, the responsibility is not entirely on the individual central nervous system to then recalibrate and figure out how to shift back down. So we're actually modeling and helping to follow the sequence of what we want in that healthy behavior. So what happens to a brain if I were to potentially run this? I got a couple of visuals. I know we're all picture people. <laughs> So what I did is I took some people and I hooked them up full EEG and I took a baseline. What's your EEG look like? I ran this little protocol, this little 30 minute protocol. I waited about five minutes and I did a second EEG. Then I waited about a half an hour later and I did a third EEG. So I got a baseline, a immediately post and about a half an hour post. Then I waited two days and I did it again. So the six images you're going to see on this slide are very first baseline, five minutes after that 30 minute protocol, and then 30 minutes after that protocol. And then what I, re I repeated the whole thing again, two days later. So what you guys are looking at here is the 21 to 40 Hertz. Each of these little heads, this is 21 Hertz, 22 Hertz. We're basically, basically looking at kind of like a beta to a little bit gamma range of activity. And this is absolute Z-squared power meaning anything that's gray is pretty much normative range activity we might expect for, this is a 42-year-old male. So this is essentially anything that would be gray would be what we'd essentially expect in sort of the, the beta and gamma range for a 42-year-old male uh, with eyes closed. These are all eyes closed. So you can see even in the baseline, this is a lot of activity. This is, this is a lot of beta activity to be happening in an eyes closed state. Yeah. And so I ran everything eyes closed. Had them close their eyes, um, ran ran the baseline collection, EEG collection, eyes closed, ran the photobiomodulation protocol, eyes closed, and then uh, ran both of the baselines, eyes closed. So I, I, I mean, this, this poor dude, he basically had his eyes closed for like two hours. He was such a trooper. <laughs> but here's what I, I want for you to notice. The actual changes in activation distribution across the, the two experiences. So one of the things that also I do a lot, and you'll see in the, in the next you know few minutes as I show you some things, one of the things that I do pretty frequently is I look at the dynamic changes. Like these, these are changes in Delta, same procedure, baseline, five minutes after, 30 minutes after. You can look at Z-scores and you can also see like how many, how what percent of the brain was above or below certain standard deviations. So these were his changes in Delta right so um let me show you like these were his changes in low beta what i'm going to do is skip just a little bit these were changes in high beta these were changes in gamma because remember gamma is where we were kind of doing that inline stem but part of what i do is i use eeg i would say dynamically right so i'm looking to see like real-time changes what's happening in the brain I promise to tell you new things. The NeuroPro, when it was released, was the most advanced photobiomodulation option out there. The NeuroPro 2, whereas the NeuroPro had eight LEDs, the NeuroPro 2 has 12, two nasal applicators, and more LEDs across the head. And, you know, these are little screenshots from sort of the, the program design stuff. The, the bit that I think, honestly, that's new and interesting and specific about the NeuroPro too, aside from the fact there's just more bang, is that they're also including a cross-frequency coupling capability where you can pick a frequency to pulse at at each individual electrode, but then you can pick a second frequency where they're going to deliver two potential frequencies, which means you can actually buddy up 
two frequencies simultaneously, which is a new and incoming feature for photobiomodulation that's never existed before in the same way. So fancy, very fancy things are happening. It's very cool. However, <laughs> when we're thinking about how you're going to potentially maybe integrate something like this soon, honestly, remember that little that little nasal clip, right? And then this little one little cerebellum placement. I've done like honestly every possible combination at this point. And what I've been interested in is what is the minimum amount? What is the minimum amount of photobiomodulation we could potentially give somebody and really see impact? Um this this was a little a little series of pre posts that I ran where again baseline eyes open this is a, a baseline collection where we're looking at behavior in four hertz we're looking at a theta behavior what I did was I took somebody and I gave them just the nasal and just the cerebellum and my interest was in kind of creating a little bit of action maybe in the lower brain we're trying try to create like a little bit of network behavior between maybe uh cerebellum and you know bottom of the frontal cortex because remember what the utility of a nasal input is that is the only part of your skull that there is no bone between that nasal input and your brain there's other things happening there's plenty of membranes and stuff going on it's not like it's just a straight shot <laughs> right but like there's no bone so when you're doing photobio transcranial photobiomodulation we got to penetrate through bone right to get to brain tissue to, tissue to create some of those effects. So the the nasal in and of itself alone is can, is a very powerful delivery option because this is the closest we get to straight to, right? And so if you're thinking like kind of what's there, like, you know, sort of the bottom of the frontal cortex, anterior cingulate, there's a lot happening right there behind the sinuses, yeah, the sinus cavity that could be quite impactful. So, um, me just putting together one nasal input in that little cerebellar, these images you're seeing, I hooked them up to the whole 419 and then made some else with S. Loretta analyses. These images you're seeing are the entire brain behavior at four hertz. This is 2.8 standard deviations of activity. Look at this 35 above one standard deviation, 5% above two standard deviations. This is the entire percent of brain activity that's above like where they are in the standard deviation behavior, right? So the reason I'm showing you this a little bit in detail is because I took a collection and I ran 15 minutes of just the nasal and just the X as the little guy at the back, just the nasal and the cerebellar placement at 10 hertz for 20 minutes, 10 hertz for 20 minutes. So this is 15 minutes post, I said that wrong. <laughs> so it was a 10 hertz pulse, no cerebellum for 20 minutes, 15 minutes after I ran that, this is what the theta was doing. Look at this jump, 67, 19% above two, 6% above three. This is a lot of theta jump. Highest finding, 4.8 standard deviations. This is 15 minutes after I ran it, right? 30 minutes later, we're down to 3.3 and we're, our numbers are 45, 5, and 1. An hour later, Remember beginning, our top, our, our highest C score in the whole brain was 2.8 at 4 hertz with a 35 and a 5, right? An hour later after running this 20 minutes, I've got a top out of 2.2 and I've gone zero above two standard deviations and I'm down to 18% so, um, cerebellum and I ran it at 10 hertz. It wasn't even in the theta range. So we had some diffuse theta that I was looking at, right? Um, okay, sure. That's interesting. A little theta, but like... What happened in gamma? We've got a couple of interesting things that happened in gamma. This is the same thing. Baseline, 15 minutes after it, 30 minutes after and an hour later, same run. I'm pretty interested in this little blue guy right here, right? Because remember, we got that little cerebellar placement. Yeah. So I am interested in this like kind of excess gamma happening up here, right? But if you look again, if you just watch those numbers, this little blue guy, 27 percent six percent of the brain was below two standard deviations we had a pretty low gamma production right here sort of that cerebellar cerebellar occipital posterior cingulate area again i'm pulsing at 10 hertz i'm not pulsing at gamma i'm pulsing at 10 hertz but the the flexibility state changes in theta and gamma 
were very noticeable. You'll see that this went from six and twenty-seven to zero and four. Just and and you'll notice like that little blue just went away. Okay, and also we saw like a, a decrease in sort of the the excess gamma in general. But what in the world was that? This is thirty-nine hertz and forty hertz baseline. This is like more like being able to see all from the bottom of the brain all the way to the top. This was the blue, like sort of that that sort of lower gamma production, thirty-nine hertz, forty hertz. This was what it looked like after that stem. This is 42 and 43 hertz. This is what it looked like after that stem. I'm I'm not stemming gamma, right? This is 44 and 45 hertz. Remember that was there was that little 44 bump? So the reason I'm showing you this is just the nasal and the cerebellum placement had full spectral impact, full brain impact just from that. So when people are thinking about like, do I want to kind of maybe try something like this, doing all the big fancy stuff seems maybe a little intimidating, maybe a little expensive. Like what potentially is even out there that is like entry level to try out or potentially even for home use, right? To help enhance brain health and brain activity, even in between neurofeedback sessions or just in general for somebody who doesn't have access to anything, right? One of the things that they dropped this past year as well is this little guy that gives you four little options for nasal. You can run two at a time or one at a time, depending on what you're interested in. But see, remember I was telling you about the different wavelengths? The different wavelengths potentially have different effects. And one of the LEDs will let you choose between a 10 hertz and a 40 hertz stem. So you're getting actually quite a few little options just for an entry level device. And it's just nose, just nasal. Because remember that possible impact from just that nasal entry? So if you're thinking like, okay, maybe I'd sort of like to try something out. Obviously, like the, the more fancy and sort of big and expensive you go, potentially the more general impact and sophistication you can have with the photobiomodulation. Like things are coming down the pike that are terribly fascinating. But as fun as all the new fancy Sloretta complex nerve feedback is, we know a skilled individual with a good couple of amplitude training protocols can have genuine life-changing impacts on somebody. I mean, there's stuff that we're still using that we developed in the 50s and 60s, right? In biofeedback and neurofeedback. Similarly, even a, a well-considered simple photobiomodulation tool can have effects on somebody that are really quite useful. So when you're thinking in terms of how do I even want to potentially integrate this into my practice, a starter option is even just having somebody use this while you do a neurofeedback session or having them purchase and use it at home more regularly in between neurofeedback sessions so that it can have more of that physiological impact that then makes the brain, helps the brain be in a better support state, supported state for, you, for it to take advantage of the neurofeedback that you're doing. So this is definitely an excellent starter place. Um, um, Penny Jean, we have yeah. a question. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Sally is interested in what the person's experience was following the stim with the QEEG changes. So the actual physiological, the um, like the clinical changes on the little, yes. Thank you very much for asking. Are you seeing these ones that I just talked about where the, the blue went away? If we're looking at the location, this is a sort of a, a left frontotemporal, almost like left in, you know, left uh, insular, left parahippocampal, like what is functionally happening at this part of the brain? Here's what I found very fascinating about the pre-post effects, right? This was an individual that is not particularly talkative. So if we're going to think about um, gamma, like for, we just say, for example, the, the gamma one, right? Where they started off with that bit of blue and, it, and, and then that disappeared right over the the 20 minutes there were two things that happened here that i thought was really quite interesting so if we're thinking oh they had a little extra theta and we're saying theta is a, a state in which you hang out in um and and you are more internally oriented and you are much less engaged with your external environment gamma is a state where you're very engaged with your external environment so we've got some general kind of diffuse theta happenings especially a little frontal you know little even even some suprietal theta we got some general diffuse data, so we're thinking those brain areas are a little bit more, a little bit less engaged with external environment, and then we've got uh, a place where they're making less gamma here, kind of in that frontotemporal region where we know 
that that supports quite a bit of verbal engagement. So this is an individual that I've known for some time. When I tried this out, this is not somebody who is garrulous. They're not a talkative individual, right? And so as I ran this on them, the most noticeable change was towards the end of the 20 minutes. And then, because, you know, I made them sit there for an hour so I could take that 15, 30, you know, minute, hour later scans. I had to sit there basically. What are you going to do for an hour? Like I can't have them watch TV because I was going to. So we, so we basically just hung out. This is a person who's not talkative. They were unusually verbal <laughs> after this. And so personal opinion, personal hypothesis, hypothesis about part of that impact was this was a deficit of a gamma frequency that we know is engagement in an area that's associated with verbalization. So so this would be less potential verbalization engagement. When that went away, when we saw the gamma sort of regulate out, although there was a typical amount of gamma in that area, and then we saw a decrease a little bit in the theta. So if gamma is gas and theta is break, we eased off the break and hit the gas a little bit. And now I've got somebody who was quite verbal, unusually verbal for that next hour or two. It actually lasted for for about 48 hours where they kind of like resettled back into being a little more, <laughs> a little a little less communicative. And so um, part of why I think that this is, I think it's worth talking about even just those simple interventions is that there's a couple of primary goals that we care about. One is how are we asking the brain for attention and what is it what is it we're asking it to do right so being able to deliver sort of a, a a recruitment for attention it matters where we do physically put those leds right but also the locations we have the leds is our potential for network how are you supposed to recruit subcortical brain behavior because we know with neurofeedback we're really using pyramidal cortical EEG. Now, if you're clever with what you choose in the cortical regions, there's a lot of, because, um, you know, cortex is kind of what we're working in, right? And then subcortical. There's actually quite a few cortical to subcortical behavioral circuits. There's a lot of uh, subthalamic, thalamic cortical and cortical circuitry. So if you pick the right cortical regions, you can change cortical behavior and that changes the inputs that are happening in those circuits. It changes the circuit behavior. So we can impact lower brain activity it with well-considered cortical input, changes in cortical input, right? So, you know, I'm not a big fan of the term biohacking only because it's gotten a little bit overused, right? But this is biohacking. Like we're hacking a circuit. And by hacking, we're just we're accessing it and then changing inputs that go into the circuit and that changes the circuit behavior. That's what neurofeedback is. So when we're thinking, how do we either standalone or supplementally improve anything, if we've got neurofeedback as a tool, we've got photobiomodulation as a tool, then we can choose where and how we put the the LEDs. Yeah, obviously if you've got neurofeedback running, you can't have a bunch of LEDs on the head or a key in you, I know we got two minutes left. This is a little bit maybe less useful currently because V-Light is collaborating in real time with BrainMaster Technologies to create a, a, a collaborative interface where the BrainMaster software directly runs the newer versions of the V-Light headsets so that we can create those EEG modulated photobiomodulation loops I was talking about over the last few years, I've been doing those very in a very Frankensteinian manner, where, for example, this would be me putting the four LEDs on the head, and these would be eight neurofeedback EEG electrodes, and I'm running these simultaneously, and the, the metrics from the EEG are modulating the electro, I'm sorry, the LEDs turning off and on. So the, the actual brain activity in real time is modulating what the LEDs are doing. However, this is a independent lead, like I've got individual electrodes, and then I've got, you know, the sort of one of the V-Light headsets sitting on top of the electrodes, right? So this is what the V-Light headset and the electrodes would, would be, you know, in locations between LEDs. That's a little bit cumbersome. You're having to put pieces from two, you know, uh, two systems together 
And so we're working on streamlining so that it is a little bit easier to do something like that. Now, here's what I will say is that, you know, the results that I've seen from putting those two together have been pretty impressive. Um, I'm just show, I'm just flashing pictures with pre posts. Like I'm I'm not really gonna uh, jump into this too much. But when when I'm thinking about like what what have I seen baseline, right? And then again using sort of the dynamic. This is before anything. This is after one session a, a session of an eight channel neuro feedback running like you know modulating the V light. This is immediately after the session, and this is two days later with nothing else in between. There are clearly impactful things happening. And so when, when we talk about potentially um, this idea of like, okay, does it make sense? Like this is EEG in the front, nerve back in the front, ner near infrared in the back. Like what happens when you do that? This is 21 to 40 hertz. Immediately after a 20 minute session, after three sessions of this little four channel nerve feedback and, you know, pulsing at the 10 hertz at the actual, these little guys are pulsing 10 hertz in the back. This is a little frontal neurofeedback, but these frontal neurofeedbacks are modulating the sort of the parietal occipital placements of the LEDs. And then sort of the level of change, because how can we make neurofeedback faster or more impactful? I mean, sure, if everybody ate a great diet, <laughs> did all the things we told them, never had a brain injury, never got COVID. Like, there's a lot of things that will make your brain more receptive and able to use neurofeedback in an optimal way. But we're working with people whose brains are just not in tip-top shape. So being able to use something like photobiomodulation that supports potential energy production and recruitment at a cellular level, whether we're using that you know, home use in between neurofeedback sessions, whether you're going to use it at the neurofeedback session, because part of what I even went here to say was it's a, it's a, it's a little fussy, right, to try to integrate in LED placements and individual uh, electrode leads, because there's always going to be just a little bit of, you know, DC output happening that shows up in the electrical channels. Um, that's a whole other thing. But the reason I'm telling you is that even just running a nasal, if you were to run like a nasal 10 or 40 hertz, simultaneously as doing maybe like a, a an alpha or a gamma neurofeedback protocol, where you've got a location here that is not on top of any of your electrodes, and they, they are not closed loop modulating each other, but you're doing them at the same time. You're asking for like a little alpha, a little alpha training in the back, and then a little anterior cingulate photobiomodulation 10 hertz. The potential impact of even just doing them concurrently in a session is pretty significant. So we've got fully independent options. Then we've got maybe concurrently, but not interacting. And then we've got potential for actual interaction. We've got these closed loops, right? Where the EEG in real time can modulate in a neurofeedback session. And then the photobiomodulation is not just, oh, we've got the 810 steady state. Ooh, we've got the extra layer of pulsing at 10 or 40 hertz or whatever hertz, which alone contains information. Now it's turning off and on based on the EEG changes. Now we've got like a third level of feedback. If we can sync that up with like the, the auditory and visual, we're creating complex, immersive experiences that is impossible for a brain to get bored with and gives them almost like more support as they try to reorganize and learn more context right more information through more channels so more isn't always better but having the option to go from from a few simple layers to a few sophisticated layers this just allows us a, a level of efficacy that we haven't had before okay that was kind of my whole presentation. I am happy to hang out for a few minutes and answer questions. I very much understand if the lovely people modulating need to hop off. So I am available for probably another 10, 15 minutes. Um, and then we could, we could also close it out if we need to.
Uh, Sally left a comment. Uh, she said, very pleased to hear the plans for Brain Master and V-Lite, as I know the more recent V-Lite headsets haven't integrated with Brain yeah. of our. Uh, yeah. I managed to source an older V-Lite headset. Thanks so much for the info today. I love your passion for all of this. And I kind of want to piggyback off of that just because I think that would be such a really like interesting collaboration. Most of the work that we do, we've used like um uh, the brainwave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we mostly use the whole um, photobiomodulation on the whole head rather than specific sites. And then including the neuro uh, neurofeedback with that would be really interesting and really helpful to like add another layer of help for Absolutely. our clients yes what what i'll say is that there are a lot of really kind of cool options on the market yeah i mean i'm really i'm really excited about the direction that we're going with neuromodulation in general and the idea of being able to have more layered and sort of clever or sophisticated conversations with the brain um i think is going to ironically, make technology more accessible and potentially even at a home use level in the next five to 10 years. And by that, I mean, if we can program, this is part of what I'm doing with like the NeuroPro 2. I actually had a meeting with um, the engineers this morning. And what we're doing is I'm going to program some fairly sophisticated sequence protocols, and then they are going to make those available where I'm doing like literally complicated fancy things on the back end but it's all going to be set up and programmed and then the user just has to click and it runs the sequence for them right they just put the equipment on they click so they have to make all the choices the choice they have to make is okay here's a little description of the protocol i think this is what i would like to have happen let's try this one what that does though is is as we're you know sort of testing out more sophisticated advanced stuff on the back end trying to keep that user front end a little bit simple right? The sweet spot here, I think is going to be simple interface, complex, sophisticated backend. Because to date, a lot of the development in the neuromodulation field has been, here's, a, here's, some, here's some expanding options for everybody, but you have to sort of manually build out what you want. So you have to know what you want, and then you have to pick it all, and then you kind of have to program it, whether it's in the brain avatar, brain master software, or the NeuroPro software, or just anything. The options are amazing, but for a lot of people, they're overwhelming. And I don't have to tell you guys, you're in the education business. There's a bit of a learning curve for understanding like frequency science, right? And how it impacts neurophysiology. So you can't just hand a bunch of options to a random person and be like, pick some stuff and fix your brain. So us being able to, first of all, just build these into the tech and then to have sort of the ongoing research and validation over the next five to 10 years of some of these protocol designs that we can then make available to maybe a home user even, you know, after some, some time and some, some validation, some replication. But this is the direction that we're going now is making more complex things available, even for people with no learning curve at all. And that's really nice to hear just because we all know that the neurofeedback field and the photobiomodulation field don't really talk to each other very much. So having <laughs> collaboration um, just across the field, even with different systems and having them integrate and bringing that more accessibility to people that can reach more yeah. clients and everything is very, very exciting. Yeah, and lowering that threshold to enter both based on education and financial means. Yeah, that's really great. Mm -hmm.